All right, everyone, it seems like uh, we're ready to start. Can everybody hear uh, in our uh, in-person setup okay? All right, we're good to go. Uh, thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, good morning and uh, for every uh, for many members who uh, may be joining from around the world, uh, good day to you all, uh, depending on where you're joining. Uh, we are the Penn Institute uh, for Urban Research Forum on Informality, a group of early career researchers across different disciplines and institutions to explore how informality shapes urban development. We encourage interactions across academic and professional settings and seek to foster greater collaboration between researchers and practitioners working on issues of urban informality. For those of you who are not members, we encourage uh, you to consider joining by scanning the QR code uh, that was uh, presented earlier. It'll also be featured at the end of the presentation uh, uh, for those um, uh, who would like. I think it'll also be available in the chat as part of the session as well for our virtual members. The other members of the forum steering group, Kimberly, Stephanie, Anushka, and I are excited to welcome our distinguished uh, panel of speakers uh, to this month's Conversations on Informality, a seminar series that fosters dialogue on urban informality among academicians and practitioners. As mentioned earlier, this month we're discussing sustainable heat solutions in informal settlements of the global south, Integrating heat sensitive strategies into basic service provisions and other activities in these communities is a complex undertaking to say the least, uh, requiring coordination across sectors and advocacy and, and engagement efforts down to the household level. And we have three eminent speakers on our panel to share their insights. Sheila Patel uh, is the founder and director of the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Centers, SPARC India, based in Mumbai, in partnership with the National Slum Dweller Federation, Mahila Milan, and Slum Dwellers International, whose board she was previously uh, chairing. She has been nationally and internationally recognized for her work empowering urban poor communities in gaining access to housing and basic infrastructure services, uh, and was recognized uh, just this week uh, by Penn IUR. And we're very honored that she's joining us from Philadelphia. Uh, I'm also thrilled to welcome uh, the Honorable Mayor of Kelimani, uh, Mozambique, who I oh who is who has uh, uh, joined us? We're very excited. Uh, Dr. Manuel de Araujo, uh, Mayor de Araujo, is a, a passionate advocate for equitable urban climate solutions and has been active in global institutions such as UCLG, ICLE, as well as the National Council of Mozambican Mayors Association Congress. He holds a PhD from University of East Anglia and a master's degree from SOAS University of London, and he is also being honored by Penn IUR, which we are eager to celebrate uh, and hear more from. And then last but not least is our very own uh, Professor Jeannie Birch. She is the Lawrence C. Nussdorf uh, Chair of Urban Research and Education, teaches uh, courses in global urbanization as well. Uh, she serves as the uh, Chair of the Graduate Group in City and Regional Planning, the Co-Director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research, Co-Editor of the City in the 21st Century Series at the University of Pennsylvania Press, and Co-Editor of the SSRN Urban Research e-Journal, and has a very deep engagement on topics of urban informality and the global environment. Uh, again, my name is Sam Gelden. I'll uh, be moderating today's panel. Uh, before I hand it over to Professor Birch, I just wanted to let you know that we are recording this session. Uh, while the panelists are presenting, we'll have uh, uh, the chat uh, disabled and we'll mute all attendees. However, uh, we strongly encourage you to for our virtual members to put your questions in the Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll also uh, ask uh, for uh, uh, our panelists in person to just raise their hands uh, after uh, uh, everyone presents uh, for your questions. So I'll now hand it over to Professor Birch for her presentation, after which we'll hear then from uh, Ms. Patel and then uh, Mayor Dale Rajo. Slide. According to the most recent report of the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, climate change is significantly increasing exposure to extreme heat. This map that you see before you 
uh, shows the locations that have experienced high temperatures and high humidity levels as represented by the highest 1% of daily maximum West Bulk temperatures between 1979 and 2017. The darker colors show more severe combinations of heat and humidity. You notice that some areas have already experienced conditions of at or near 35 degrees centigrade, that's 95 degrees Fahrenheit for the United States, which are peak wet bulb temperatures. As I will demonstrate in the subsequent slides, many of these places overlap with locations featuring large numbers of informal settlements. Next slide, please. By mid-century, the IPC projects that 2 degrees centigrade uh, warming will vastly increase the high heat index days. If one compares the top historical and the bottom projected conditions, on the left, you can see that these high heat conditions coincide with rapid urbanization growth, uh, particularly in Africa and Asia. And on the right, you can see the uh, actually the mapping of these things right there. Next slide, please. In urban areas, the urban heat island effect further increases heat risk due to microclimate conditions caused by the geometry and materials of the built environment, that is, tall buildings absorbing heat and reducing natural ventilation, as well as human activities such as running engines and uh, air conditioning. Many cities have been planned or have organically developed without extensive vegetation sources and water that produces the natural curling effect. And many cities, as we'll hear from the mayor today, have been affected by natural disasters that have deeply affected the vegetation in those cities. So we have a lot to work with here. Next slide, please. As a result of extreme heat exposure and other urban conditions, you can see in the top and center boxes, we expect poor health outcomes in the bottom box, the largest segments of the population. However, there are many factors listed in the gray boxes on the left and the right that can positively or negatively influence these outcomes. Some of the key factors that influence vulnerability for individuals are shown in the right box and include social detriments to health and behavioral choices. Some key factors that influence vulnerability, vulnerability at larger scales, such as the natural and built environments, governance and management, and institutions are shown in the left box. All of these are influencing factors that can affect an individual's and the community's huge exposure, vulnerability, and capacity to adapt. And we will be talking about that with our panelists today. Next slide, please. Heat affects people differently. And when we talk about informal settlements and other marginalized populations, these groups and the demographics within these groups face disproportionate exposure and risk to extreme heat. Age, existing health conditions, income, the suitability of dwellings where people spend time indoors, the preparedness of people spending time outdoors as part of their livelihood, local access to basic services and critical health care, all elevate individual risk in informal settlements and communities. Just take a look at this list and you can see, very vulnerable. The next slide, please. This brings us to the economic consequences for communities and individuals who are often forced to pursue their livelihoods outdoors in extreme heat conditions. Evident from this slide in South and Southeast Asia, West and Central Africa bear the heaviest burden of loss of working hours. Look at those graphs. Next slide, please. Heat stress not only affects the health of individuals and communities at the lower end of the scale, but in the long run, the over-economic burden increases, increases uh, burdens on cities. Illustrated here, you see those linkages. I know this is a bit of a complex graphic, but the bottom line is often observed adversely exposed to this heat stress, people living and working informally are guaranteed poor health outcomes, especially in the face of the dearth of safeguards from extreme heat. This increase in health care costs leads to decreased economic production, increased costs for firms to maintain productivity, among others. Because the informal economy plays such a large role in many urban areas in Africa and Asia, addressing the consequences of extreme heat means not only thinking about preventive measures in informal settlements and housing, but also for uh, protecting the highly mobile populations. Next slide, please. So what is the quantum of the issue? 
Of the world's estimated 1 billion people living in informal settlements, 61% are in Asia. Likewise, between 30 and 85% of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa's urban population lives in informal housing, a figure which continues to grow. This growth is expected to be concentrated in small and medium-sized settlements with a million people or less, often with an elevated risk of heat exposure. On the positive side, we are already have many tools and strategies to address extreme heat challenges. This diagram shows one set of design-based interventions at the building level of an informal settlement. It incorporates green space and natural cooling mechanisms to lower indoor and outdoor temperatures in situ. But the steps and resources needed to make these and additional changes in informal settlements to reduce the health and economic impacts of extreme heat require extensive household level engagement, <clears throat> coordination, short and long-term planning, as my co-panelists will no doubt highlight in their talk today. With that, next slide. I want to inform our discussion today with several questions, which we will be addressing today. First, what challenges and needs remain unaddressed as communities prepare for more extreme heat conditions at the same time that they seek improved living conditions? I know both of you are facing that. To what extent can these communities leapfrog ahead using low carbon heat sensitive innovations? We're very eager to hear about that. Thirdly, what roles should public, private, and civil society institutions engage in to support heat proofing informal settlements? And lastly, what models of leadership and collective advocacy can spur poor, pro poor climate action in informal settlements? These are a set of hefty questions, and we will now turn to Sheila Patel to begin to address them, and then on to the mayor. Gina, you couldn't have done a better job to frame my presentation. <laughs> so uh, I am a grassroots activist. I've been doing this work since 1974, so you could calculate my age. <laughs> <laughs> we won't do that. Oh, you can. I'm a proud Asian who likes to be an elder. So uh, my entire career up to very recent times was to create organizations of the poor locally, nationally, and globally to aggregate the demands, expectations, and requests of poor communities, especially the women in the communities, to look at what they need from their cities, from their duty bearers, from the rest of the population who they all serve all the time. And by and large, urban poverty is generally ignored. Local and national and international development assistance wants to keep reversing urbanization, want people to go back to uh, their villages as if it's a very virtuous thing. And for us to not acknowledge the demographic reality that we are now an urban planet in which 40 to 60% of populations in the global south in cities live informally. These are very, very conservative estimates because most censuses don't accurately put all the informal habitats accurately documented in the national statistics. Very often, urban habitats are not even included as special categories. We do have it in India, but I know many countries that don't. No, they're not mapped. They're not counted. Not, no. <clears throat> and so informal settlements are the black holes of cities in which there is no secure tenure as a result of a old colonial historical planning system. Everybody in the North, educators, you have to change the way in which you teach young people who come from the global south planning because Asian African planners that I have met come to your elite institutions, learn high standards of planning that must be approved, which are exclusionary. So as a result of these exclusions, which historically and exponentially expand the informal sector, you have larger and larger populations that don't have water sanitation, that are under the threat of evictions, and have to deal with 
being a beneficiary of some charity of the state or of uh, philanthropy. And most NGOs have been pushed to become project managers and contractors of what philanthropy and government wants to do. So very rarely can we have the guts to say this is what people want. So I'm one of those. <laughs> and during the COVID period, I came up with three realizations. The first was that from the UN down, climate change and development are two different silos. You have SDGs, and then you have the climate compact. And there are a little bit of development in the climate context, little here. And cities are more or less seen as consumers and the bad part of the world planet's health. So all this is wrong. And we have to, all of us who work in urban areas, have to put our foot down to say there is no virtuosity in trying to bring change that we've not been able to do for the past century. And that the colonial institutional education that designed Southern cities to serve the colonists continues now and works for the elite in these countries. So that's my first point. My second point is that no poor community can get anything by itself. And no development institutional arrangements acknowledges that the women in those informal settlements are the true managers. They are the ones who defend against evictions. They are the ones who scamper around for making sure that their children eat. They scamper around to get their kids to school without the kind of identity documentation that many schools need for children to go to school, like birth certificates. So our our process is a movement. It's a social movement of the urban poor in which women are at the center. And for the last 40 years of the work that we do as Slum Dwellers International and what we do in India as part, we have an unusual situation in which the federations of the urban poor are the primary members of Slum Dwellers International. And we as NGOs are affiliated. So we've reversed the way in which most of the time, the formal institution is the member and the little tail at the back is the large social movements. We reverse that. We want you to acknowledge that. We want you to appreciate that. And we want you to work with them. What we do is we give primacy to bringing all the knowledge through women to the neighborhoods because we believe that the challenges are intergenerational, I know Mr. Mayor is going to say how difficult his life is with all the legalities of informality, which is an oxymoron anyway. And the fact that there are such institutional barriers to getting development investment in these places, that the pursuit and the quest for this is like a marathon. And in our movement, we say men are 100 meter dash guys, and the women are the marathon runners. <laughs> so when we want some quick things to do, one day go and agitate, something we send the men. When we want to do slow, drudging work, we get the women. So happy to is a drudging work. And that's why we bring women to the center. So all this while, we know that lots of development research, lot of educational activity, lots of work we do as NGOs has been in the pursuit of getting tenure. And knock, knock, what do you know? Only 8% of people living in urban areas, I know in Asia and Africa, I don't know Latin America, have tenure. And a little pinprick of one or 2% get government subsidies. So what have we been doing? We've been looking at the light from that pinprick. So that was one problem. And now we find during COVID, when the kind of exchanges and discussions that would happen between the slum communities were stopped because you couldn't travel at all, we took to the web. Every single woman leader has a secondhand cell phone, smartphone. They have a little data. And we talk to each other every Wednesday. And in the last two years, a, pro a process that began by talking about COVID and what to do with curfews and what to do with WHO not knowing what to tell slum dwellers to do about washing hands when there's no water. All these things came out and gave us a lot of food for 
challenging the FAO and the WHO and all these global institutions who keep talking about the poor but have no solutions for them. <laughs> so we said that now we need to look at the challenges that the women were saying that they are facing, which happen to be the ones that Jeannie talked about. It starts with dealing with extreme weather for which their humble survival habitats just cannot cope with. And in our case, we don't stay with heat. We have wind, rain, and heat. Because the heat produces the wind and the rain. These crazy weather patterns that change, this gushing like water that comes into some parts, cyclones that come. And so out of all the discussions that we had, these women from these 38 countries, 32 countries, said we have five priorities. The first one is what do we do with flying roofs? We were all in Durban when the cyclone came and all the women who were with me from Southern Africa had people who had died in their neighborhoods because the tin roofs flew away and hit people and they died. And my colleague from South Africa and the mayor of Durban took the whole morning off to visit those communities to see what had happened. So we said, we have to do something with roof. So we said, and we have this, this tradition that whatever we do, we have to give it a name. So the name was Roof Over Our Heads. <laughs> and it's not just about roofs, it's about walls and floors and neighborhoods and everything. But the, but the symbol in all poor people's home is, do I have a roof over my head? So we said, so we, they call it different things. We have a name in every language, but in Asia and in Hindi, Persian, Urdu, Ru is soul. So we say, for poor people, their home is their soul. That's what protects us. Nice twist. The second thing they said is food. Poor people in cities are eating white carbs, and it's producing lots of nutritional and health problems. And it's a transition that is happening so fast that it's producing chronic disease burdens that we have never heard about and infectious disease because of heat. So they said, we don't want to put food and health together, although they are connected. So we started a campaign called Greens and My Meals. Everybody went to their city officials and asked for open spaces to do vegetables. And we have about five or 10 hero mayors. You have to check whether you're one of them. <laughs> but if you're not, you don't need them. Yes, exactly. So the idea is, and, the, and there was a mayor in, uh, and we have videos and we will share them with all of you, where this mayor in, in, in the Philippines spent 40% of her budget to provide women's savings groups uh, plots of land and support from the agriculture department because these are second generation urban women. They don't know how to grow things. <laughs> they taught them and they created these patches where if you volunteered to work there, you got few vegetables and the rest of them could buy it at subsidized costs that would cover the cost of these people's labor, mm -hmm. seeds and the management. And we want to encourage all mayors to do that. But again, of you. eat and water. That's right. right. So that was the second one. The third thing was health. Uh, during COVID, most of our governments bought ventilators for hospitals and oxygen units when the real need was to produce primary health care. And most cities are not equipped to provide primary health care to their informal residents. So we started a campaign that wherever there were primary health care centers, could we work in partnership with those as women to facilitate vaccination, to do health checkups, and to do things like that. And now that's becoming a big campaign. We're going to do it once we get roof over our heads, we're going to come there again. The fourth one was transport. You know, in cities, everybody wants to do very sexy public transport to get people who are in cars to go into public transport. They are messing with poor people because informal transport is getting messed up because everybody wants everybody to be in the buses, which are now sanitized, air-conditioned, and very expensive and not 
possible and affordable for daily. So what do you do with the governance structures of informal? Uh, because there is a, a, a present governance structure, which is not good, but it's a whole different part of the city. So how do formal and informal transport structures work for people living in form? Because they all have to, a majority of them have to go and service all of us or who the transport is made if they can't afford. So transport. So we are part of a global transport network that's trying to do that called agility. And the last one is disasters. You know, poor people are now, we are all liberated. We said evictions are man-made and climate disasters are also man-made. So we are not going to separate them. We're going to put them together because they devastate our homes in the same way. So we want to say that poor women are the first responders for both all kinds of disasters. They are the ones who go and bring women and children together, they cook food for it, and they are treated so badly by the international and national uh, aid providers who treat them like, you know, they dish out food. They, they don't involve them in creating a support structure. They are given things, they are told to do things. And, you know, in one particular situation, we had a European relief agency. I'm not telling you their name because I'm negotiating with them. <laughs> <laughs> telling us about the ethics of delivery of services. These are community <laughs> women. You're going to train them about the ethics of delivery to themselves. <laughs> so we are saying that community people are not victims. They are the warriors against climate change. They are warriors against the disaster management process. And therefore, you have to treat them as the first responders. And we are creating a protocol of how we work with the city to identify all the vulnerabilities in informal settlements in general and how we will create a link and a protocol that should disasters happen. How can the city and the informal networks work together? So these are the five areas. And right now we are developing a global campaign called Roof Over Our Heads, in which we are saying people need new knowledge, new science, new technology, new materials, and new designs to spend the money that they're already spending on producing a resilient home. And we want to co-produce this solution in 100 localities. We call them 100 labs. I'm already negotiating with him because <laughs> I, I know his city and I've been there. And I know that Mozambique has faced so many disasters. So he's going to help me get all the other mayors. Definitely. You got them. <laughs> because I, I know the university. So to get the mayors, we'll work with you. So now I got you. So the idea is that we do 100 labs in Asia, Africa, and Latin America with community networks that will commit themselves to working for the next three years in a lab. Mm -hmm. So we will work with the community. We will work with the artisanal contractors. We will work with the material providers, both formal and informal. We will work with you design schools. Oh, we're so happy. <laughs> so that both in the North and South, you have new design systems that get officially recognized. And last, but who should come first, are the mayors. Because they are as hamstrung in dealing with informality, but they never come in partnership with us to fight the national governments. Because they feel that if they don't, if they oppose the national government, they won't get the money. <laughs> but we have to find new ways of global alliances to do this. So I am trying to work with the global covenant of mayors to find 25 voluntary cities, volunteering cities that will ask us to work in their cities with them and the informal. Oh, okay. So that's my pitch. Well, informal. That's Thank a you. Very powerful and potent pitch. And we've got a mayor right here who's going to respond. You have got my city as the first one. Yes. You'll be the first city in Africa ever. Yes. So tell us, Mayor, about the challenges that you've heard Sheila talk about. But of course, you have your own mind about what challenges you are facing as you govern your city. So 
Well, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this very distinguished uh, meeting. And also, it's always a pleasure to be <laughs> with my sister here. I have always learned from her, and it's really uh, a pleasure to be sharing this panel. Uh, first of all, I think I must start by saying that it was very difficult for me to come here. Yes. Because as you know, on the 11th of March, my city was severely hit, but Cyclone Freddy, yes. which uh, left um, thousands of people homeless. And <coughs> as she was telling me the impact of climate change, I, I was like, well, <laughs> this is like my city. I just went through it. And I, I must confess that um, on the day of the cyclone, for the first time in my life, I felt alone. I felt alone because the management structure of my city collapsed completely. Not only the ceiling of the city literally and physically went, disappeared, vanished. We couldn't even, even find the remains of it. But uh, my management team disappeared. So when the cyclone stopped, the first thing I did was, well, I'm going to see what was left. Because during the night, it was so powerful. We had like 240 kilometers per hour. You can imagine it's like a Boeing taking off. And uh, I couldn't move because all the trees had fallen. Starting from the house I lived, like I couldn't open the gate. I couldn't go out. I couldn't drive. I, and of course, I couldn't call any anyone because the, the three lines were cut off. So, well, I took my machete. I was like, well. I need to go to my office. You know? At least I, I need to know if the office is, is there, if I still have an, an office. I went there, of course, I found that the ceiling was gone and um, documents were like wet and computers and so on. But my biggest challenge was that nobody was there. <laughs> like I told, I mean, I pre prepared like my disaster management team and specifically, I trusted the police because they are like a kind of a paramilitary unit, yeah. the municipal police. So I had given order that, you know, look, on the day I want everyone, all the police, municipal police there, so that if there was any emergency, I will have pe pe people to, to work with. Uh, I mean, I must say that my city don't have a fire, firefighters yet, so I'm still negotiating to, to, to see if I can have the first firefighting unit. But everybody thought that their house and themselves were the priority. They, they, they forgot that even to recover their houses, which were, of course, affected, they needed a job. But at that point, for two days, I had to go literally house to house to, house to pick them and try to tell them, look, we are the guardians of the people. People are waiting for us. I understand that you do have a challenge, but we cannot forget that we are the garden of, of, of the city. That was, as I said, the first time I really felt alone and that the model we, we were using to manage the city was totally wrong and we need to revamp. And as my sister said here, we need to reconceptualize the cities in the global south. She said, and very well, very eloquently, I cannot say better than she said, that the cities that we have are still the colonial cities. And those cities are very hierarchical, are very, are not inclusive, are men-centered, and do not cater for the youth, women, and children. They served a, served a certain purpose, but today they do not match the challenges that we face. And what happened to, the, to what I call the post-colonial state was that the new leaders after in, in independence from the fifth of the, the, the Second World War, most countries in, in, in the global south be, 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 became independent. But one, that transition was a kind of an inheritance of all model. You know, like the mayor, like myself, I move in the former Colonial yes. mayor's house. The governor lives in the former colonial house. The head of state, like we literally moved from, from where we were living, and then we 
went literally and physically to occupy what was left by the, the, the former masters. But then this impaired our way of thinking. We started thinking that like them, our priorities, which should have been different, became the same priorities. The state model, the state apparatus became the same. Not like those movements and parties which liberate us became the oppressors. So today we are going into a process of liberating ourselves from the liberators, for those who brought <laughs> independence to us. You know, it's quite ironic and challenging. And sometimes I really feel sad. I don't, sad because we, even to say, uh, just to tell a story. Yesterday, as I was landing here, the first message which came when I landed at New York University was that the police commander from my city was sacked. And why was he sacked? Fired, yes. Yeah, but who did it? The National Co 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 Commander of, of the Police. The yes, the, the, the National Police, yeah. Not a local force. No, but why was he sacked? He was sacked because a rapper, a very famous rapper in Mozambique, he passed away on the 15th of March. His name was Azagaya. And a national outcry movement of solidarity, young people, musicians, they went to the streets orderly to pay their tribute to this rapper. But for the government, this was a, a movement they could not control. So what did they do? They sent the police and they beat them. Like people died, others lost their eyes, others were in hospital and so on. But fortunately, the old Mo Mozambique has got like uh, fifth, uh, 11 capital cities because we have 11 provinces. The only march which was peaceful from beginning to the end and where the police actually escorted us was my city, Kilimani city. As a result, the provincial commander was sacked because he did not follow the orders not to allow the march because apparently those marching were planning a coup. I mean, how can you plan a coup with a pen or with a, with a... So these concepts of the new independent state becoming more oppressing than sometimes even the, the former colonial masters is something that challenges my understanding. So what can you do about that? Well, first of all, I'm doing what I should be doing. I'm telling the world what happened in my city okay. and in, in my country. But it's very difficult to challenge the national institutions to, to keep challenging every day. That's yeah. our like day to day challenge, you know, to bring. But the youth, fortunately, the youth today they are losing uh, fear, they are gaining courage, and they are challenging the institutions. But the way they reprimand those peaceful manifestations. Is the same way they manage the laws and the, the bylaws. And like it's, it's a sort top down model that it's impermeable to any suggestion coming from, from the ground. Like one of the challenges that might and which leaves me very frustrated is that all big leapfrog steps in my country where acquired or achieved through violence. That's the lesson that I get from my country. And it leaves me sad. Like for us to get our independence, we to go through a 10 years armed struggle against the, the Portuguese. But you yourself have been there for many, many years successfully. And I'm not successful. Well, you survived. You survived. I'm a survivor. You're there. See, now, so I, don't, I, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. So tell us a little bit about the kinds of work that you've been doing at the local level to help nurture this new way of thinking, particularly after your crisis with the cyclone, the loss of all the greenery that you had planted to <laughs> deal with the, and to deal with uh, bringing nature into your city. Tell us, tell us, What's next and how, how you've been managing all this? Well, we have been working. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, 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 to start answering your question is like to say that 70%, fortunately, 70% of the population in my city are young. Yes. And between 65 to 
are women. And normally in, in, in the policy making system, those are left out. But by, by realizing those numbers, I and my government, I, 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 uh, my local government, we decided to bring them, the youth and women to the center of our police action. And the entry point for us was using mobility. Because in my, my, my city is known as the biking city or the biking capital city of Mozambique. <laughs> But we are facing strong opposition, both from central government and from those who own cars, because <laughs> I built the first cycle lane in my country, not only in my city. And then he showed up at COP 27 on crutches because someone ran into him. <laughs> no. Which means it's that my city needs more cycle lanes to protect those cycle lanes. I'm known as the biking mayor, uh -huh. because I go work and whatever you, you using. But so are youth and women involved in biking? Yes, we involved, but for them, but yes, yes. yes. Like what do we realized was that lack of infrastructure prevents more women and, ch and children for biking. So that's one of the reasons why we build the first cycle line so, so, so that women can feel safe for them to bike. But as, as I said, there are other forces, those who own cars, they said roads were made for cars, not for biking. Therefore, if you want, you can, you can, I mean, they, they say literally like that, you can build your cycle lanes somewhere else. Well, that will mean building another city because they don't want me to touch what was already there. And I have shown them the transport mode. You know, if we want to democratize the roads, we need to take into account how many people use which kind of uh, which kind of mobility. Like we have about forty percent of, of, of people they walk. We have about thirty five percent of people they bike, and only twenty to twenty five percent they on motorbikes plus cars. Meaning that if we want to use those demographics, I mean the biggest chunk of Roads will go for pedestrians, then to cyclists and to cars. But and, you, and at the same time, you're dealing with bringing together the exactly. climate change and the SDG initiatives in terms they don't of poverty, climate change, about, et cetera. And even health, because if, health, you, if you buy it, it helps to your health. But <laughs> but because those who buy, like when I won my first election in 2011, those bikings were seen as third class citizens, as the outcasters. Like they were not seen as belonging to the city. But because I started biking, today, biking in my city is seen. I mean, pe people are proud of biking. Like we have to make that change and that, that shift, bringing, including those who were otherwise left out to the center of our policy making. The, the first step. For me, imagine having like 6,000 bicycles without a single traffic light. It was a nightmare. So the first <laughs> policy that we took was to install traffic lights in, 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 in order to control the movement right. and, and to put a sense of discipline. Uh, like tourists, they could not drive in my city because you know, you will see bicycles all over the, 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 the place. And the second, was to put the zebra crossings. Oh. And now we are like in the third stage, which is to build cycle lanes. Actually, last week, I inaugurated the second cycle line uh, in my So, so what city. you're telling us is there are very tangible projects that you can do as a mayor. A mayor can do many things. No, we have, we have a lot to do. This is very emblematic of this change that you're calling for, both of you, through these kinds of projects that meet multiple goals and of course, address the most vulnerable populations. So that's extremely exciting in terms of the work that you're doing and I'm sure we'll be doing in the future. I'm wondering if we have any questions from the audience. I'm just uh, going to look at Sam 
or from our local people here. <laughs> yeah, I'll start with you, <laughs> please. Yes, thank you, Sheila and, and Honorable Mayor, for your, your presentation. I you can just call me Manuel. 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 How about Dr. Manuel? Dr. Manuel. 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 Thank you for the incredible insights and presentations. And my heartfelt, you know, apologies for all the things that are going with Hurricane Freddy. I'm originally from Zimbabwe. I grew up there. Oh. My family still lives in Monotaurachan. <laughs> so I speak oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, we have felt some of the effects of, of Hurricane Freddy and the hurricane previous yeah. to that I died. And so, you know, a lot of the things you talk about are sort of the top down level, the policy making and the way that you're sort of, you know, working within the government structures to create changes, right? Whereas Sheila is talking about a little bit more of the grassroots level. Seems like there's a combination of the two that need to happen, you know, to make, make things happen. I, th I My question is really about how do you, what are the tools you can use to start affecting change on the policy level? Because I think a lot of the things that you talk about in Mozambique that you face, I'm sure you know, in Zimbabwe, we have exactly the same problems. What? Oh, some of them were, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we even had in 2015 the Muramba Trina, which was basically the government decided that they were going to destroy all the informal settlements in the city and just bulldoze them pretty much overnight. And after that, we did a we did a studio with a professor here, David Governor, oh. to try and actually work to, you know, work with the informal settlements and figure out how do we start to integrate them into a more inclusive city. The challenge is always what, what you brought up, that how do you choose the, the right projects and sort of these discrete moments as Jeannie mentioned and tangible projects that actually can start to, you know, affect change? Well, thank Sorry, you. That's a multi-pronged question. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. I mean, I, uh, I'm i very happy that the first question comes from Zimbabwe. Because Zimbabwe is like my second home. I, I did my first master's. At you uh, then? Exactly. Oh, fantastic. You then, yes. Professor Sam Moyo and... Yes, uh, yes, he's a family friend. David <laughs> and so on. So I'm very happy. It's a small place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I know quite well the process okay. and, and the challenge that uh, Zimbabwe went through. Yes. Uh, and, but also like the mayors of Oparare, Bulawayo and yeah. Mutare, yeah. they are, I mean, we work together in several networks. So yeah. we share some, some of those challenges. Well, but going to a question, as you said, we suffered. Cyclone Irae, we had Cyclone Gombe, Cyclone Anna, and like all, for the case of Mozambique this year, the meteorological services uh, informed us that from January to June, we're going to face 10 cyclones. So you, you can imagine. But one of the biggest challenges is, is that mayors, most of the, of, of the mayors don't have the formal tools or the training to deal with this kind of issues. You, unfortunately, you learn by doing. But of course, there are several policies that one can, can or strategy or tools one can use. One is like uh, engaging the, the grassroots, like working with organizations like, uh, like uh, PAS and, and, and other organizations which uh, represent and bring those uh, 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 the issues from the ground. Because most of the time, when you are in the office, of course, you are convinced that you have power. Sometimes you don't. Because, like for, for example, in Zimbabwe, most of the cities are run by opposition, yeah. uh, by, by, by mayors from the opposition, meaning that uh, there is the, the communication channel yeah. is already at the state level. Once yes, you show that there's no success. Exactly, and uh, like uh, uh, I had a meeting. Uh, we had a meeting. All the mayors from Mozambique with you are. I mean, with Zimbabwe's minister of. Lo local and, 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 and I was quite uh, uh, amazed because he wanted to sell the, the Zimbabwe model. But <laughs> probably he, he didn't know that I lived in, in Zimbabwe. Of course, I embarrassed him a while back. But, but, but <laughs> then we became friends. Right? Right. But uh, the challenge is structural. The first is legal. I mean, different mayors in Southern Africa have different powers, of course. In Mozambique, we have executive mayors who have a real budget, then you can inform and you can take decisions. But in Malawi, for example, mayors don't, don't they are not executive mayors, they're like ceremonial mayors. Yeah. They cannot disburse the budget and, and, and so on. So they feel quite limited. Sometimes they approve projects, 
And then the chief executive officer, who is the man who marrying the budget, is appointed by the minister. So if it happens that he's not from the ruling party, then the challenges he faces are all, almost uh, impossible to, to overcome. So those are, 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 are like the leader. <coughs> constraint. Then are uh, the institutional constraint, depending on if you belong to the ruling party or you don't, then you, you know there, there, there's always a challenge. But to me, the biggest challenge, the, at least me as a mayor, I, I do face is human resources. Because like if you have trained people and qualified people, you can over, overcome those challenges. But the, the point is that because of the most of the African countries in the post-colonial period, the states became too centralized and too to, to top down, which makes, and because the development process is not happening at the rate of population growth, most young people, they move to the capital or to the bigger cities. Then intermediate cities like mine are like deserted. It's like an internal brain drain. Like the most capable, they move to the, the capital. And then you are left with the biggest problems and the least people. The least capacitated <laughs> So we we need to reverse that, uh, and that's and one of the advantage I do have is that, is, is that because I was a lecturer before, so at least I've got kind of uh, 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 an easy way of dealing with universities. Then I can go there and borrow some capacity from the local university or others. But why other mayors, they are like afraid of the, they see the university as like an elephant cow and an <laughs> impenetrable thing. So there is here a real challenge. So we, if we want to change something, we need to give real capacity to those working in local government. And even for ex extreme events like uh, Cyclone, Freddy, Idai, Gombe, and you name them, and even, even in Mozambique, where a, a local name, one of the cyclones was called Makwakwa. Like this cyclone, I mean, these challenges are faced, like mayors and local governments are in the forefront of cl uh, climate change extreme events. For example, the mayor of, the former mayor of Beira, for five full days, he was in Beira when cyclone Idai came which, and destroyed 9% of Beira city. He was there for five days. He couldn't talk on the phone. He could not ask for help. No plane could land because of the weather conditions. No uh, ships could come to help. No cars could come because the roads were blocked. No train could come in. And even the little money that he had kept in the banks could not use it because there was no ele electricity. So for those five days, you survive on your own. The same for me, it wasn't five days, it was three days. No communication. No plane, no train, no cars coming. And my city was affected. Like we are 15 days without running water because the water system was completely collapsed. It collapsed. So like 15 days. As a result, the first challenge was cholera. And there was no provision of cholera, treatments, medicines, and, and so on. Then they had come from Maputo, like. 10 days, 15 days, but like people were already dying because yeah. cholera <laughs> affects you quickly. And so, like, there are structural challenges, there are legal challenges, there are institutional challenges, and there are capacity building challenges, and of course, financial challenges. We need, I wouldn't say one is more important than the other. If, yeah. if you're there, one which is important to me is human capacity. Because if you have the, the, the human capacity, then you can tap on the other capacities. But we need really to work on your capacity. But if you have trained people, they will know where to get the money and how to frame the projects or the needs of the people or of the local government in order to match the requirements from like the African Development Bank or other philanthropists. But if you don't have the human capacity, you can even articulate your problems on a way that uh, the banking sector or the funding partners will see it as a problem and will fund. Because normally they say, we need bankable pro projects, but yeah. how many local governments can really design yeah. a bankable projects uh, using the rules that the banks and other funding institutions want? So we need also, like I think, and the university and centers like this will play a very important role in bringing together those with money, those with knowledge, and those on the forefront, 
think there is a big gap there that needs to be filled. Well, I think between the two of you, <laughs> you yeah. can't be able to find a way well, to face that. it. And so um, and we are very limited I don't know if I in our question. time. We have, we, have, <laughs> we, have a question. we have a question online, which we will add, and then the question here, and then we're going to get to, well, ask you to make short answers because Gee, we could go on all day. <laughs> well, I was shocked that you had it only for an hour. I know. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, uh, we're not going to stay within our hour. It'll be longer. But at any rate, let's get our question from the online. We have a question from uh, Saba Usmani. Um, would I'm going to unmute you if you're able to uh, ask it yourself. Uh, if not, I can uh, uh, repeat it myself. Saba? Hi, um, uh, I'm a public health researcher, environmental health researcher. Um, uh, so I was wondering, like, when it comes to understanding kind of spatial distribution of this vulnerability, what type of health studies are helpful for policymakers? And how do we test the efficacy of these interventions that target informal settlements? Health studies. Thanks so much. Informal settlements. Health studies. Well, first of all, uh, the 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 formal and institutional rituals don't do any of that. So uh, very rarely is there adequate machinery in even big municipalities where you know how many children in how many neighborhoods have had vaccinations. What is the, you know, like right now, there's a global crisis in the South of undernourished children below five years. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you do with that? That's a whole generation that's going to be destroyed because of that process. So uh, a very important thing is that all this knowledge, like uh, our mayor said, is uh, based on, uh, on, it's like what <laughs> globally is a standard, but locally is impossible because you don't have institutional arrangements that allow for that. Mm -hmm. And even if they allowed it, you don't know what to do with it. What are you going to do when you find every child below five is undernourished? So it requires a new institutional framework in which this is what we do in, in SDI. We are looking at ways by which women in the community uh, begin to be the first responders. So, how do you put a kid into on a weighing machine and look at a graph chart to say who's got an adequate height and weight? Simple things. Even those things are not done for people living informally. And then these issues of infrastructure that produce infectious diseases. Uh, I don't know what's the tuberculosis in your thing, but in most of the global south, there's a serious crisis of the re eruption of both infectious and chronic diseases. And we have no idea of the real volume of these. So your question is very important. But again, these are all treated as super special. And most cities are serving the children of elites for their obesity. You know, I mean, that's the, the basic structure. For the basic structure of how do you put you. together primary health care? Yeah. For, for example, one of the reasons why I mentioned the legal framework was that, for example, in Mozambique, there is a law passed by the government in 2006 saying that primary health care and primary education in municipalities should be run by the municipalities. Yes. But it's there. They're not there. But it's not implemented. Only Makoto City got some healthcare unities. We have 630 municipalities and we have been asked, I myself, I get a team, we responded to all the questions needed to go and they just said, we are not giving it to you. And I, I ask why? Because it's power. Like those who have to, de to devolve power, they've got an interest in keeping it. So they just said, we are not giving it to you. Forget it. And, then, the then, and for example, UNICEF came up with data saying that 55% of the children in two provinces, which have got like 20% of Mo Mo Mozambique's 30 million inhabitants, which is the province of Nampula and Zambezia, 55% of the children are malnourished. Of course, what do we do with that data? Well, we are starting uh, programs to, um, that we use West, 
to transform waste into compost, and then we distribute that compost to families so that they can increase their food production. Food production. And then we teach them how to, to, to minimize losses at the farm, uh, in the process of transporting the goods, and then also while selling it in, in, in the market. And plus, uh, we give them like nutrition lessons, like how best they can mix the products that they have in order to increase the nutrition result. But both are like, there's more things that we can more, do. More to, be yeah. done. more to be done. We have a question back here. This will be our last question. Sure, yeah. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, discussion. My name is Indiva. I work on uh, politics of land and citizenship in Hyderabad informal settlements. So my question is about something Sheila mentioned about the siloing of climate and SDGs. And it's unfortunate because I feel like from the beginning, voices from the Global South have been saying we have to think of them together and SDGs are primary in the Global South. So why does that siloing continue You know, as a mayor from the Global South and as a movement and NGO leader from the Global South? What do you see as a process by which that siloing continues? I'm considered very rude for saying these things. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's because that's true. But the thing is that, see, there's a, there's a paradox. Uh, you can't produce solutions unless you focus. When you focus, you narrow down what you can do. When you narrow down what you can do, you exclude everything else. So it's like a, it's like a bad cycle. You know, and so you know that when the SDGs were formed, there was fights and arguments about who has to do what, which SDG. All of us, I was in the uh, in the millennium. Where, oh, we should have hundred million people who will get out of living informally. I mean, we have all these targets without resources, without knowledge, without like you say tenure politics, nothing. But you just to put all this in the air. Do you know that our governments give very often our governments provide data that is not right, mm -hmm. but the UN is not allowed to take data that is produced by us. So there are lots of these kinds of things that become exclusionary that then further sharpen the, the, the sort of siloed behavior because everybody, want, you know, and the other problem is that when you operate globally, your vision becomes myopic. You just want it, and, and development is the biggest enemy of real development, <laughs> the development community, because we've all become obsessed with quickies. You know, you want a three-year project to solve three generations of challenges, and 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 it, there's a management system where you have to tick all the boxes. So you do all those things, but the problem doesn't go, and nobody wants. And then people like us who are truth sayers, we become excluded. Because we say politically incorrect things. Yeah. You know, so I think that's our biggest challenge. But, but you're also, you well, mentioned to us this summer that when we were asking you about nature-based solutions, you said, well, yes, we're trying to work with the mangroves, but people need those mangroves for their houses and for their livelihoods and so forth. So you're faced with poverty and climate issues. Yeah. And that's like, he uh, just took. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but but we, no, no. Yeah. She finished it. But, but, yeah, I, I, I agree with her. But the point is, you know, we were we were in, in, in implementing a climate change project where, of course, my, my, my city was built on the banks of a, of a river uh, and they like on a swamp. So, meaning that uh, we are very vulnerable to both uh, flooding, erosion, and so on. So, like the first line of defense of my city are mangroves. But because people are poor, they cut the mangroves, either for cooking or for building their own houses. So when I was running that question, uh, I mean, that project, some people came to me that they said, but Mr. Mayor, do mangroves vote? <laughs> <laughs> like, and the question was, why are you so worried with the mangroves? Like, I mean, what about us? For us to leave? What? But the question they are trying to put is, was that, what are the alternatives? They understand that mangroves are very useful for the ecosystem. They are very, you know, like fish, they depend on fish, on fish you know, like 70% of the population there, they get their income from fishing. So they understand that they bought us off the mangroves. But the point is, what are the alternatives? So the, that's how we came, we partner with the UN Habitat and we built the first 12, what we call resilient houses which are houses built with local material other than the mangroves. But 
it's still for them it's ex ex relatively expensive as compared, of course, in the short term. Because if, if you look at the impact of, of the mangrove in the long term, then that, that, that's when you have like cyclone and, and so on. And the other project we tried was like to transform uh, waste into biogas. But to scale it up, we need resources, we need knowledge, we need, we need like partners and other people who know how to do these things at the other scale. We did a, a pilot project, which was very successful. But as I said, we are looking for partnership that could come up either with the human resources or with the financial resources to help us to scale up both experience. Just to finalize, the biggest challenge to your question to me is what I call the current uh, world, world order in, in, in the sense that the UN is also very hierarchical. You know, when the UN comes to a country, they put in their mind that uh, the way the people in the charter mean working with the government means central governments, not local governments. For the UN to come to work with individual cities, it's a very long process. Their mindset is not prepared to work with local government. So we need to change the UN mindset because if you look at the 18 or 19 SDGs, Sorry, but I have got my work at the moment from my own. So, and I'm trying to sell them. <laughs> the 17, how many don't happen in cities? Very few. Most of them, if, if not all of them, for them, for her to achieve them, you need a place, a concrete place. And most of the concrete places are cities, but mayors are not taken into account when, when the UN is deciding, when the UN is formulating, when the UN, it's like, when the time to implement comes, central government rely on mayors. But when the UN is discussing, the mayors are not there. So that's why we are fighting for mayors to have see formal cities in cities in those discussions. And I mean, we are making some inroads, but very slow. <clears throat> uh, at least, late. At least the, the, the UN habitats managed to kind of incorporate in some of places, but other UN ag agencies, they, 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 they don't have space for, 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 for mayors, but they want mayors to work for them. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why there is this silence. Well, we have 20th century institutions for the 21st century. Oh, thank so, you. So we need to make them 21st century institutions. And I have great faith that you two are going to be in the leadership of that transition that we will have. And I want to thank you very much for this inspiring and wonderful discussion we've had today. Let's give them a hand. Those of you who are in campus uh, on Friday, we will have more talks by our two guests who will be receiving the Urban Leadership Award. And of course, we invite you to attend that. So thank you very, very much for coming today and for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much.